decision you're in. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, I am Bill Finch. I'm the chairman of the Beverly Historic District Commission. And I will hereby call this meeting, which is uh, basically, is this our regular April meeting? or No. I will well, function. It can oh. function. Yeah. Please this is our regular uh, April meeting. Um, we have two items on the agenda. I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item is a uh, is under the city's demolition delay ordinance. It's for the demolition of the structure located at 211 Rantoul Street, which is a, currently the Ford Motors uh, showroom repair facility. Um, the applicant is Windover, who are proposing to put new construction on the site. Um, the second item is the continuation <coughs> essentially of uh, a certificate of appropriateness for the construction of free apartment units at 42 Water Street in Beverly, mm -hmm. uh, 42 Water Street, 27 Front Street. Um, and uh, so I will start off with what happened since a number of you are not familiar with this probably. Um, the demolition delay ordinance requires the commission to review the, any applications for the demolition of uh, any building in the city that's older than 50 years, 50 years or older. Um, we have to make a determination when we receive that application from the building department, we have 10 days to review it and make a determination of whether we think the building is uh, clearly not historically significant um, and therefore not under the jurisdiction of the ordinance or that we think the building might be considered historically significant. It's not a finding that it is, it's a might be. And in the cases where there are, where we think it could be, we are obligated to hold a public hearing on the matter within 20 days of that finding, which is why we're here today. Um, the, uh, you know, the vast majority of applications actually don't go to this stage. Um, but um, this one we determined should go to a hearing. Um, we have to make two determinations at this hearing. After hearing uh, a presentation from the owner, uh, the applicant, um, and after opening it to the public and hearing comments from the public relative to the application in the building. We have to decide whether the building first is historically significant to the city of Beverly in our judgment based on the conditions set aside in the ordinance. Um, if we determine that it's not historically significant, we go no further, and that ends the discussion. Um, the building inspector is notified, and he proceeds to issue the requested permit. Um, if, we if we decide that it is historically significant, we have to make a second ruling as to whether the building is, um, using the term of the ordinance, quote, preferably preserved, unquote, um, and, and essentially to the, and is significant to the uh, history of Beverly and of s such significance that there is public benefit to preserving it, at which point, if we make that finding that it is just preferably preserved, building inspector is notified and he holds up the permit um, for one year <coughs> from the date of our finding, after which um, the applicant may proceed to demolish the building. There are a few other conditions on it before, the, before he can issue a building permit, for our demolition permit, final demolition permit. The owner of the building proponent also has to have gotten all of its permits for the new construction or whatever it is that's going to take place on the site. So it may even be longer than a year, depending on the particular process. Um, if we determine the building does not meet the terms of preferably preserved, <coughs> then the building inspector is so notified, and even though we determined it historically significant, because it doesn't get the designation of preferably preserved, he may then issue the permit you know, immediately or when the owner requests it. Um, this is not a taking of private property rights. This is a permit process. Um, and it doesn't permanently present, prevent an owner from 
uh, te tearing down a building that comes with this. It issues a delay, and the purpose of the delay is hopefully for the owner, uh, perhaps with the assistance of this commission and the city, <coughs> to find a solution that enables him to preserve the building rather than tear it down. Um, we've had a number of cases, and some of them result in the preservation of the building, others don't. <coughs> um, okay. So, as I say, the process is for the owner, first of all, to make <coughs> a presentation to all of us. Um, then, um, you know, the commission members during that can ask the owner questions if they so desire. The public may not. We then open the hearing up to the public for comments. We ask you to state your name and address before you make comments uh, for the record. Um, we hear folks, uh, when everybody has had a chance to speak who wishes to, we close the public hearing and go back into regular session. And our board members discuss the issue um, and you know, make our findings we made ask further questions of the applicant. We may not, it depends on the situation. Um, and we usually make our finding the, the day of the hearing. I expect we will today. Um, so that's basically it. Now, I know that there's probably a lot of concern about the proposed new construction. This is not a review of new construction. Uh, <clears throat> our, our jurisdiction is limited to making a judgment as to whether the building in question, the property in question, is historically significant to the city and whether it warrants a designation that preferably is preserved in the imposition of the delay. Um, so we ask you to restrict your comments to the questions of the historic value of the property. Um, we do not get involved in reviewing the proposal of, of the proponent for new construction to replace it that's the jurisdiction of other boards. And those of you who are concerned about that should have opportunity, as this project may or may not proceed, to make comments germane to those issues. Um, so uh, I guess that said, I'll ask Tom, do you want to present? Yes, uh, Mr. Present? Chairman, for the record, uh, Tom Alexander with uh, all our offices at 1 School Street in Beverly. <coughs> Excellent job, not surprisingly, seeing that you drafted this ordinance what, some 27, 28 years ago when I was city solicitor. So, it, it, and I'm, you, you really did a good job. In, it's airtight, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> airtight. Couldn't be better. And, uh, and a lot, it's going to allow me to, to talk a little less. So I thank you very much. Uh, just quickly, I, I have with me uh, Chris Copeland on behalf of the owner of the property. And Thad Masco, uh, the architect, uh, will be reviewing... Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the history of the property in just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so thank you. Uh, uh, just briefly, uh, this building is uh, about 23,000 square feet, more or less. Uh, about uh, two-thirds of it is actually uh, uh, just cement block in the, in the rear, uh, and only a third of it in the front uh, is uh, other than that. And, and that's the part that um, uh, it, it would if there was to be uh, any uh, historical interest, that might be where it is. Um, uh, the, um, of course, that, that part of the building, much of the original uh, detail is gone uh, and, and, or covered over uh, so that it's, uh, it's not, it's not, there's not much of what was there when it was originally built. This is, and this is this building is I think would be characterized as uh, a, a kind of a nondescript generic mercantile building, and it's not a, a building that uh, uh, was. And I'm, I'm going to quote some of the specific criteria in, in the ordinance, which is what we go by here. Uh, it's not a building that uh, is, is that was built by a famous architect or a famous builder. Uh, it uh, it's not in a historic district. Uh, it's not within 150 feet of it. The building itself is not within 150 feet of a historic district either. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not associated with one or more historic persons or events, and I'm just going right down the, the list here. I don't think there's any evidence of any of this. Uh, 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 or with the broad architectural, cultural, economic, political, or social history of the city. Uh, I'm gonna, well, one of the criterion 
that uh, I'm going to ask Thad Samasco uh, in his presentation to go into a little bit, uh, but we also believe that uh, it is uh, not architecturally significant in terms of period, style, method of building construction, or in, again, association with a significant architect or builder. Um, so the, um, I'd ask uh, Thad just to give you a little presentation here about the building and the site. I'm going to interrupt you yeah, just one you second and make the point that the criteria, we, the criteria we work under are basically the National Register of Historic Places criteria. And buildings can be determined to be historically significant under that for a variety of actually four different reasons. I'm going to not be able to remember one of them. But <laughs> archaeology is one, architectural, uh, it's architecture of the building is another. And then associations of the building, whether it's to, to an important personage, George Washington slept here or whatever, or an important event, an industrial building that has to do with um, you know, very important uh, industrial development, as in United Shoe Building, as an example. Um, so those are the primary um, considerations. And that method of construction. What's the, what's the method of construction is another one. Is that a separate one? Yeah. Okay. Method of construction, technology, et cetera. Um, I would have thought that's under architecture. Construction is separate. Um, at any rate, those are the criteria that we need to deal with, that we need to use to make our judgments, and the criteria that I would ask you to deal with in your comments, frankly. Um, so, go ahead, Matt. Great, thank you. Uh, that's Samasco, Samasco and Burbridge Architects in Beverly, also a Beverly resident. I'll run through this quickly and then wait you know, for your questions and comments. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, it's the project's located at 211 Rantoul Street. This is the property, the building here. Uh, Beverly Depot is here. The park is here. Um, the post office is there. And that is the building. That is Bow Street. That's Waller Street. That's the Jacqueline Tower, the seven story or so tower. Uh, I think it's actually nine stories on the corner. So, uh, when the Odell Depot uh, Story District was developed, they did, our building is actually located underneath where this that blue arrow is. Um, they did not capture that in the district, and as Tom mentioned, uh, it's more than a, this building is more than 150 feet away from the outline of that district. But our building is located right under that. Those two pictures are numbers eight and nine. Uh, in terms of a, of a site plan, this is Rantoul Street, Bow Street coming across the north, Wall Street coming across the south. The building occupies a fair bit of the parcel, as you can see here. Uh, notably, there's a fair bit of it that is not on the street uh, edge, and there's a fair bit here that's not on the street edge, which I'll show you what, what that means in a second. Um, this is a partial floor plan. The building comes back here like that to there to there. About, as Tom mentioned, about a third of it is a sales floor and two thirds of it is a big open kind of repair shop. Uh, the front third has, has some brick facade, the back third is concrete block and steel sash. This was the uh, drawing that was submitted to the building inspector for the demolition that, uh, that indicated things about safety and hazardous materials and so forth just for the record. So this is the existing building looking south from down Rantoul Street with Bow Street up here on the left. What's happened because of the way this is used is there are no real defined sidewalks and curb cuts. It's just kind of the cars kind of go over the curb, kind of wherever they, they kind of feel like it. Um, this is looking at it straight on across the street uh, from almost the bootstraps building. Um, this guy sold me a car when I came back across the street after taking a picture. This is basically the building uh, as, it, as it exists today. Looking down uh, Wallace Street, you can see that front third of, of showroom kind of building and the back two thirds of industrial kind of building. Um, as you know, as you probably know if you've been there, this, there's no real curb here in the cars on both sides of the street. Ford kind of uses little bit randomly. They did take out a piece of the storefront in this location to put in the door that they can drive the cars in and out of the, the showroom. I'm not sure exactly how they got them in before that was done. Um, this is a bit of the detail of the building. Um, this 
there's the only thing that actually is original that's left is the brick that has been painted, and there's a bit of wooden frame to the original storefront. The rest of this is, has been altered <coughs> over the years. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Off the back of the building, uh, where I'm sorry, this is the uh, Wall Street side. Sorry, this is looking toward Grand Tool, the concrete block structure, a bunch of plywood over the top of some of old, some old steel industrial sash on this side. On the other side and on the rear, um, they have replaced that industrial sash. Looks like 19, late 50s, 1960s vintage uh, aluminum uh, framed windows. Building the, the building is blocked and painted on, on you know two thirds of it, and the front is it's, the front third is essentially painted brick. Going back to the uh, the history in 1919, this is where the site was here. It was a vacant lot. The Choke heirs had a beautiful home here and probably owned this piece of land adjacent in 1919. This is 45 Broadway, which is the veterans' housing is now, and Boris store now is built in front of it in that location. But in 1919, it was pretty clean. So this is what it looked like looking toward the site. This is Broadway. That's 45 Broadway, the beautiful house. Uh, that's the Choke house. And our lot is actually in here, and it's vacant. And right across where Jacob Towers is was, a, was a, some form of factory. You can actually see the water tower for the factory built right on the property line. You can see from this atlas, that's the outline of the building right on the, right on the line. Same vintage photo. Generally, the streetcars are now in place. Uh, the Choate's house is here, uh, and the vacant lot is still there. Interesting, the overhead wires and the streetcars at the time. Beautiful um, cast iron fence and granite curb. Uh, this photo is looking up Bow Street across Grand Tool, and the back side of the site was an open ear uh, theater. Whether you drove your car in or walked in, uh, I don't know, I suspect you walked it in in 1910. Uh, on this, it's on our site around the back part. In the 30s and roughly into the 40s, our building was built, uh, Boris Store was built, same style of, I'll call it generic, mercantile architecture, brick piers, infill, Beverly Glass had it, uh, which is also an auto dealership. Tom and Ed is placed across from uh, the CVS has that same general kind of, of architecture. Uh, it was also similar at 131 Rand Tool, the old Oldsmobile dealership. Um, that was raised to make the new building at 131. This is a photo from a telephone directory, uh, I believe, um, advertising the Harbor Garage Company, which was the owner of the Ford dealership then. A little bit closer in, you can see the building at the time had an interesting transom. It's kind of interesting glazing detail, a slate or, or tile roof, this mansard, interesting bracketry kind of a nice entrance piece here. Especially, you can tell, you know, all that's, all that's gone. The photo I showed you up close of this pier, you can see the ceiling inside the space comes at this level. So those transoms, if they were there, are up above the ceiling, which now has a bunch of HVAC above it. And this is it now. So if you look at what's, what's here now, there's the non-period, I guess, gooseneck lamps. The transoms are gone. The bricks have been painted. The, the, the storefront is maybe kind of there, um, but there's not much, I don't think, of significant detail you know, left to the building. Uh, it seems to me that this was not designed by a famous architect, like the Packard Block in Boston, which was done by Albert Kahn. Uh, it's a fairly generic kind of commercial architecture of its period. Uh, and it is not also you know, it does stop, interestingly, about 75% or so of the, of the length of the street, so there's a big gap there, which we think would be improved by, you know, maybe a more street, street line. So with that, I think, Tom, if you want to talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Dad. <coughs> um, wow. So, um, so just an overview of a building, an older building, uh, kind of non nondescript. Um, it, uh, it again jumping back to the specific criteria that the, the board is charged with with finding um, 
that uh, there's, no, uh, there's no indication that it was associated with any historic person or events um, that uh, we don't see and that, that, that there were really any historically or architecturally important period style or method of building uh, uh, details that are left at this point. Um, and uh, it's, um, so that would be the, the historical significant piece of it that, uh, that we don't believe the criterion is satisfied. Uh, and that, uh, therefore, you, you would even get to the preferably preserved, but if you did so, so think that you needed to, um, the, it's, um, you know, the, then it's required that uh, another finding be made that it made an important contribution to the historical and cultural resources of the city. Um, and I, I don't think that there's any evidence that that would apply here. So um, we're available to answer any questions you might have, and we, we, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to present tonight. Okay. Um, I will also, I think you, most of you could see that, but this, the historic photograph of the building, I'll pass this around to anybody who wants to look at it more closely. No. And or you know, the same material that's in there. I can't see it. It's in there. Yeah. There's another copy. Yeah, same. Um, okay. uh, and uh, that said, you know, do the commissioners have any questions before we open the hearing? Um, what is the distance <coughs> to the uh, National Register District? 100, and we measured off it's 180 feet. Okay, um, I am going to hereby open this uh, public hearing on the matter of uh, a demolition application and demolition for 211 Rand Tool Street. Uh, I'm going to start it by reading a letter from Estelle Rand, who is a ward to counselor, as most of you know. Um, I will read this into the record and we'll, we'll have it. I actually have a couple of letters here uh, that I will read into the record. Um, Okay, this is from uh, Estelle Rand. Uh, I am unable to attend the Historic Commission public hearing for 211 Rand Tool Street due to prior commitment. Uh, I would like to share my thoughts with the Historic Commission, though. Please see my comments below, dear Historic Commissioners. Thank you for taking a moment to consider my letter and, the op and opinion as it relates to the potential demolition of 211 Rand Tool Street or the Ford dealership building. I respect your ability to determine the historic significance of a structure and am thankful for the opportunity to participate in your process. Uh, I often hear from constituents that they are concerned that the character of Rand Tool Street is being changed uh, or lost due to consistent redevelopment of Rand, due to the consistent redevelopment of Rand Tool Street. There is no doubt that the character of Rand Tool Street is changing. I often ask the question, what aspect of the current Rand Tool Street character could we focus on preserving? I agree that there is room for improvement on Rand Tool Street, but I also feel that with a multitude of new buildings, the street becomes culturally and architecturally unanchored. I understand that the Ford building has been severely altered. I would ask that a minimum, that at a minimum, there is a recommendation to preserve aspects of the actual facade to be incorporated into the new construction. The final redevelopment would be more effectively culturally connected to our community if some aspect of the existing structure or facade can be preserved. Secondly, Beverly's history of car manufacturing and selling is unique and worth preservation. It is so interesting to me that in 2017, one can buy a car two blocks away from one of the busiest train stops in Massachusetts. The use of 211 Rand Tool Street and its future use as a transit-oriented development is ironic. It makes sense that mixed-use development will someday replace a car dealership. Perhaps the finished space can help tell the story of car manufacturing and selling in downtown Beverly, similar to the way the Cummings Center has incorporated the story of the shoe into its public spaces. I appreciate your consideration of my opinion and consideration of the constituent input that I received. <coughs> uh, please feel free to contact me with any questions respectfully. Uh, Estelle Rand, City Council Award 2. Okay. So the second uh, note that I have here is, uh, I guess, something that we received by email. Yes. Um, 
and this is from a John and Jeanette Cuff, C-U-F-F-E, 31 Atlantic Avenue. Um, Estelle Rand indicated that we were gathering feedback part of the planned demolition of the historic Kelly Ford building. As my wife and I cannot attend the meeting, I thought an email might suffice to convey our personal point of view. We have two points we'd like to make. One is that a city should attempt to preserve and what makes it unique and attractive. When we moved here a few years ago, the historic architecture of individual homes and of municipal buildings, e.g. City Hall, the library, etc., was one of Beverly's draws. As such, they tipped the scale towards choosing Beverly versus nearby towns. If my wife and I are an example, historic structures constitute an asset, and city le leaders should want to protect assets. The second point concerns Windover. While their individual buildings are reasonably attractive, the recent proliferation threatens to create an architectural homogeneity that borders on the mundane. Enough such structures and a city can become overrun with block <coughs> after block of upscale yet not non, non, nonetheless generic facades. The end result may in time be an affluent version of a sprawling tenement project. Would it not be preferable to leverage that which makes Beverly the unique and interesting city that she is and incorporate facades such as the early 20th century brick front of the Kelly Building into any ultimate structure? Granted that a much revised car dealership is not the sexiest historic <laughs> preservation project, but saving what remains of this slice of Beverly history has value in its own right and also seems preferable to seeing the city <coughs> building by building erase its history while committing to an architectural future pr predicated on a vision of Beverly by Windover. Um, okay, that's regards John and Jeanette Cup. Um, then the next one is from a Maureen McQueen. Uh, she doesn't uh, state her address here. This was again an email. <coughs> to express my opinion on demolishing the Ford dealership on Rain Tool Street and having Windover build another ugly apartment building in its place. I think we need more housing for over 55 folks. My vote is no. Thank you, Marie and Queen. Um, you know, I would take pains to point out that the content of some of these goes beyond what our jurisdiction is. Um, we're, we're not here to judge Windover or architecture of the place and the appropriateness of the place that we're here to judge whether or not this particular structure warrants preservation. Um, so that said, um, and I guess I will also make the comment that you know, meeting the criteria of being historically significant or for that matter perhaps preferably preserved doesn't mean that a building has to be done by a famous <coughs> architect um, or be a dramatic uh, 18th century house of grand style or a state house. It, it may be a, an important example of a type <coughs> that may be much more vernacular and plain Jane, but still architectural value, contribute to streetscape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that having been said, uh, would anyone like to make comments either for or against the proposal? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm John Hall. I live at 143 uh, Colon Street. Um, I'll try to stick to the main points, but I kind of think there's some sort of, I don't think you can completely judge the, the value of this building in isolation. Um, I own a graphic design business. It's been located on Randall Street for about 10 years, currently in Porter Mill, and before that I was in the Harbor Place building. They're both old buildings. Um, one of my long-term clients is the Urban Land Institute, which is a think tank in Washington um, on urban development, for whom I produce a variety of publications on pedestrian and transit-oriented design and urban placemaking. Um, I chose to move my business to Rantoul Street over Quainter Cabot because I appreciated the industrial grit and history of the area. So I'm speaking to someone who loves and appreciates old building, but also someone who supports, who fully supports the redevelopment of the area and the concept of transit-oriented development. Um, Certainly, um, as I look to, look to the future, to the rebirth of Rantoul Street, certainly the street needed some investment, but I thought it had huge potential. While new construction and more residential housing would clearly need to be part of the mix, I imagine that much of the rebirth would be in the form of rehab and adaptive reuse of some of the area's industrial buildings and 
spaces like Porter Mill and Gateway. But as I've watched closely over the first decade of redevelopment, I've been disappointed to see that virtually every new development has involved the wholesale clearing of an entire block and the construction of almost exclusively large-scale apartment buildings. Um, aside from the Veterans Housing Project, which I think was a really well-done project and shows a Wendover is capable of you know, thoughtful, historical res um, restoration, but that building wasn't something that the average resident or visitor experiences. Uh, not a single commercial project undertaken during this time on Randall Street Corridor has involved any aspect of historical preservation or adaptive reuse, something that I feel is key to the success of an urban district. Taken as a whole, these new buildings are also well out of scale for the area, and I feel that Rantoul Street is in danger of losing the historic appeal that drew me here in the first place, and the pedestrian scale that is so desirable in such a district. As far as this specific building, I was encouraged when um, Mr. Copeland, the president of Wendover, stated at his planning board meeting last spring that he liked the way this dealership building looked and hoped to preserve the structure. Um, yet I was disappointed again when it turned out that that view had changed. While the building may have lost some of its original detail over the years and is not that attractive in its current painted white facade, it still maintains its place as the oldest and most intact example of an automobile-oriented business remaining on Rantoul Street. And as the story of an earlier period of Rantoul Street was the railroad and the former hotels around the depot, the story of the later 20th century Rantoul Street was the automobile and automobile-oriented businesses. That is a period that should be preserved as well. In during, doing research, I came across a story and video exploring Boston's former auto mart between Austin and Kenmore Square on Commonwealth Avenue, which is home to dozens of examples of restored and reused auto dealerships. Well, many are more grand than this building. Some are strikingly similar. In Boston, they have been converted to areas from art galleries to supermarkets to restaurants and office space. Shouldn't we at least explore preserving the historic piece of our auto mart? In terms of reuse potential, many of the businesses that have the most buzz these days are businesses that are attracted to old converted industrial spaces. Locally, just think of Gentilly Brewery right here in Beverly or Notch Brewery in Salem. Both capitalize on the industrial feel of their spaces. Beverly has even modified its zoning recently to encourage these types of businesses. In a quick Google search, I came across nearly a dozen examples just of breweries and former car dealerships. It really seems to be a thing. Flatbread Pizza just converted a completely nondescript tire store in Salem into an inviting and attractive restaurant space. I would consider that particular building completely unremarkable if the city and developer deemed it worthy of, adaptive, of an adaptive reuse in a prime location in Salem. Rantoul Street with its rough around the edges industrial vibe is the perfect environment to capitalize on this trend, but by focusing exclusively on teardowns and large scale, nearly exclusively residential buildings, we are losing both the scale and history of what makes Rantoul Street unique. I would argue that to preserve the historical significance of Rantoul Street's automobile history, as well as to maintain the reuse potential of a solid pedestrian scale period building, in an area that many people feel is in danger of becoming a canyon of oversized buildings that a demolition delay is, uh, on this structure is wanted. I would also encourage the developer to further explore his originally stated intention of preserving the structure of this building, perhaps in conjunction with more modestly scaled residential. Thank you. And not, uh, I brought the uh, story on Boston's auto model and a bunch of breweries from auto dealers. That's enough. Okay. Uh, this is okay. um, the most like that. Are there individuals you wish to speak? Yes, Hi, I'm Jim Wallace, um, the executive director of Beverly Main Streets, and I live at 34 South Terrace. And there are two comments that I would like to make, and I don't know if the second is part of your purview, but it is actually a shame that all of what was historic about this building, that all that is left is the corner. That's a real shame. But the fact of the matter is, that's what it looks like. That's what it is. And so I think that's what it used to look like, it has long since been painted over, tiled over, boarded over, ripped off. And I think we have to look at the reality of what that is. And my second point is, if there is anybody thinking about, well, maybe I might vote for it, maybe I might not, I ask you to consider the impact on yet another huge empty building on the businesses on Rantoul Street. 
who have been really dealing for the last year and will be for another four or five months with total reconstruction of that street. And if this building sits empty for yet another year after all that investment on Rantoul Street, that's really going to be a sorry situation. And I would not be surprised if some of those businesses didn't make it. So if there's any wiggle room, I would ask that that balance be considered. Thank you. Um, other individuals who would like to speak? I had a, a question. I'm Scott Hayes from uh, 12 Melbourne from Government. I, I, I was also under the understanding that Winover was going to be building other buildings as well. Pardon? I, I was under the understanding that Winover was going to be building some other buildings as well. Um, I can't speak for them, but I, you know, they have been building buildings, and I think they're planning. And, and they I heard they were planning for like three or four more in the city. I, I can't answer that, and it's not really germane to what we're That's talking about. Okay. Maybe Ellison was going to answer. Maybe Ellison was going to answer. Oh, I, I don't know about three or four. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We're building it. Up at Goat Hill and then something down by YMCA and then up by another place on Rantoul Street I was told last month. Are they building it friendlies? And friendlies as well, I heard. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't know exactly. You're right. I don't know the final plans. I don't know. I'm <laughs> not sure why that's relevant. We are building the friendly, friendly site. That's one of no, I'm just wondering with all these new buildings, where, where is everybody coming from? And then with, you know, the overcrowding of schools and, and then yeah, this, the traffic. That's and, beyond. Yeah, the no, no, this, this is probably right. not the right thing. I understand. Thank you. Um, further comments from folks? Yes. Yes, uh, my name is James Samos. I live on Bow Street. Um, they, uh, someone had mentioned that much of the original detail is either gone or covered over. Can you speak to what has been covered over and what is still there behind? Sure. Uh, I have uh, yet to be able to see through walls. Um, <laughs> but right. Well, uh, but, sorry. Um, if you want to just go back to that picture of the building, the building. Go back to the front facade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that little. Um, arched element, uh, I think, from the photograph, appears to be an original element yeah. that does remain. Um, this, that, the, and this corner, um, and probably the capital on it, remains. The trim on the top, I don't think, has anything to do with what was there historically, in terms of the corners. The roof is a picture that it has that. It has, it has, it has, it has a tile, a short tile roof with a gutter under that and so on. Um, if you go to the side view, oh, flip back. No, I'm, well, you don't want to work. Um, yeah. <laughs> These, there are some industrial type windows that we can see the lower half of in a couple of days and uh, that may be able to address it. Um, I don't know whether they, the remainder of them exists behind, you know, the covering or not. These are industrial steel, uh, steel windows. Uh, I can, there, there are, behind these plywood panels are the original steel sash. Um, by energy code, they're not thermally broken, so they don't meet the energy code. They're glazed probably with a specialist laden glazing compound, and, and, and again, they're, they're single pane glass. So typically when you do a, re a res restoration of like this, the windows come out and do windows that simulate these windows go back in. Uh, on the back side and on the on the Bow Street side, those windows have all been taken out and filled in with an aluminum 1960s, late 50s vintage fixed glass kind of panel. Only on this side uh, are they available. You can see they just ply with them in. Back in this corner here, there's some offices on the interior. They just kind of boarded over the top. Uh, and in terms of the, sorry, go back one. So I, I don't know if there's a, a if the original transom is back behind this stucco, it could be, but the ceiling is coming right in through there. Uh, I, I doubt that it is. Um, the, the, um, this, as Bill mentioned, this parapet detail is original. There's a base here of concrete, and these brick piers are original. This trim here does not appear to be original. 
the frame of this window, the wooden part, no doubt let's go to paint fully is original, but there's some aluminum struts in here that look like they were a, a later add. So in terms of that pretty picture from the 1930s, which had the, the cool uh, Spanish tile roof and the wooden brackets and the interesting entrance and the transom panels and all of that, that's, that appears to be gone. Um, in terms of covered, I don't know exactly what's covered. Looking at looking at the photograph, actually these capitals aren't original. They're added because the photograph shows that the pilot is rising up to the top. Thirty seconds. Um, back and forth. Sorry, I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so the 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 Repairs were done in the 50s or 60s. I'm sorry, if the repairs were done in the 50s or 60s on some of this, wouldn't that still be older than the 50-year historic um, rules? So even if stuff was done in the 50s, in 67 is 50 years ago now, that would still fall under the well, we, we, we We have a general criteria when we're dealing with judging historic value and what should be saved, what shouldn't, et cetera or even in a rehab, what should be kept and what shouldn't is we, we do consider that changes over time may be judged to be significant to the building and worthy of saving. Just because they are 60 years old as opposed to 45 doesn't, doesn't meet the criteria. The question is, in relation to the particular building you're examining, is that are those changes of major significance or are they you know, damaging or non-consequential, it becomes a judgment call. Thank you. Yes. Um, you um, say your name. Yep. Sorry, uh, Paul Wright. I'm actually uh, from Two Woodbury Court, Salem. I am on here on behalf of some friends from Beverly, who are hoping I might be able to just come and, and sit on this. So. Hopefully my comments won't be <laughs> totally You used to live on Rantoul Street. I did used to live on Rantoul Street, so. You got some uh, street risen. cred. Yes. Um, but I just wanted to speak a little bit to the design. Um, and so it's sort of a mission style um, design. So you could say that, especially when you look at the original, uh, that even though it was no famous architect designing it, it was typified of a, or distinct, um, indicative of a specific type or uh, style. Um, you could see that obviously through the years, the period, um, the style has been streamlined, sort of in a modern, uh, sort of yeah, streamlined take of the mission style. Uh, just wanted to say that they probably, I mean obviously we don't know because the people who did the rehabilitation in the 50s or 60s aren't here, but they sought to keep some of those elements of that mission style and maybe it was to keep it consistent with sort of the railroad era. Uh, mission style is a very popular architectural style in those sort of railroad junction uh, uh, developments. So maybe they thought to keep that sort of, uh, to keep things consistent, although obviously upgrading it to be modern. And so I just think what few elements there are, mostly the arch on the top and sort of just the um, general impression of the facade uh, do have some, some design there. Um, other individuals who would like to speak to the issue? Uh, Matt Pujo, 11 Longwood Avenue. Uh, just like to speak on the issue of things changing over time. When I go home at night, I drive by that little house from 1715, Johnny Appleseeds. They wanted to tear it down for five parking spaces. But this board said, you know, it has a lot of its elements gone. There's very little of the original material left, but it's important being there. It's part of the fabric. And I thank God that house wasn't torn down. And it was saved on a fluke, not because anyone really wanted to save it. And then I look at the depot district itself. We have another building that's heavily altered. But if that building goes, no more depot district. So to look at that and say, well, it's changed over time, it's not historic anymore, I think it's just a wrong opinion to have because there have been plenty of buildings that have been changed, altered. I interviewed the executive director of Historic Boston Incorporated, and you should take a look at some of the developments that they get themselves into. They take buildings that are absolutely ugly, hideous, altered, and they see that there's still hope. We can find a little bit of history in these buildings, and then when they're done with them, Everyone is, is amazed at how beautiful these things are. So when I look at that, I, I don't know what to think. I mean, I, I've listened to John's arguments. 
And I think he, he's on to something when he talks about what they do in Boston. Um, but is it something I would fall on my sword for? I'm, I'm just not sure, but I would trust the wisdom of the board. And before I end, I would like the board to just state the reason why you exist. Because many times people come in here and say, it doesn't matter what you think, we're going to do what we want. But you exist for a reason. And I'd like you to speak about why these buildings are important. So I'm going to reserve my opinion on whether that's preferably preserved or historic. I really don't know. But it obviously means something to a bunch of people in this room. Thank you. Um, uh, other individuals who would like to speak? Yes. Hi. My name is Jason Sullivan. I serve on the City Council. I live at 56 Dane Street. I just um, want to thank the Commission for their thoughtful deliberations, um, always. But I, I also wanted to lend um, some brief comments. I have several comments to make. One is I would echo Jen's comments around the historic integrity of the building. It would be wonderful if we go, could go back in time on that, but it, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious from the pictures and the presentation that a lot of the um, integrity of, of the building and the character of the building has um, deteriorated. Um, I think I agree with Mr. Hall that, um, that the adaptive reuse of the warehouse building that Windover um, uh, redeveloped is like really positive project for the city, but to compare the warehouse, that warehouse building with this building is, uh, you know, I, I, I think apples and oranges, apples and bananas, in fact. Um, I think it's also important to consider, and I don't know if this is a consideration of the commission, but to consider whether the delay is actually going to save the building. Um, in this case, I'm, I don't know the answer to that, but in this case, I'm betting that it probably won't. Um, and I also think generally we've talked for years. I've been on the city council. This is my sixth year, my last year. And I know since I've been on the council, but I know long before that as well, we've talked about transportation-oriented development being kind of a cornerstone of the redevelopment and the, and the revitalization, of, especially of Rantoul Street, um, obviously right next to um, in proximity to the train station. And that's been something that we've, um, and Jen knows better than anyone, that we've consistently stated. And I, this is a really good, obviously, ideal location for a project, um, a project like that. I think that Rantoul Street is evolving. I think we're nowhere near to be at the end of the, um, of that cycle it is a process, but I think in order to continue the progress that we're seeing on Rantoul Street, and there are a lot of exciting things happening on Rantoul Street, I think um, I think we need to make sure and be really mindful of keeping that momentum momentum going. And I think this this property here could be a big big part of that. One last point is the city just did under undergo a housing um, assessment. And um, there was somebody talking about the housing need and what, why do we need additional housing. I would really recommend you read that housing assessment and the, how, the final report because it's very clear that there's a really, really, really big need in almost all categories of housing across the board. And, um, and we have, it's not just a Beverly problem, it's a regional problem, but we share responsibility in helping to address it. And um, I think we should be mindful of that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments uh, from that? Uh, and I just have one follow-up question, I guess, to Mr. Copeland. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I was at the planning board meeting. The follow-up on what I mentioned in my statement, um, we I think you were going for the Friendlies building. <clears throat> and in a talk, one of the members asked you to sort of detail your further plans down the road. Mm -hmm. And you specifically said you liked the way the dealership looked. You wanted to try to preserve it. You didn't want to build another building up. It's specifically next to the seven-story Jocelyn Towers, which is kind of a fortress. Mm -hmm. So I guess I am wondering how you um, came to change your view on that. Sure, I'd be happy to address that. So since yeah. that meeting, um, we have looked at, at a number of ways uh, this building might 
actually play into what might be a future development, even though I don't know if that's germane to the context. But um, a couple of things I'll note, that, that north angle where the Ford sign is creates a number of challenges. It's not 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. That would create a number of premiums <coughs> of structure and design. Um, driven piles, foundation underpinning, if we were to preserve this and go over it, creates a whole level of premiums in order to um, put a foundation that's uh, sustainable to a, a structure above. Selective demolition, tedious cutting, all these things would add, would add costs uh, that we looked at. Temporary shoring of the facade, if that's to be preserved, or the whole building, but engineering and researching how that gets done safely um, is, is very expensive. Seismic compliance is a big issue. We looked at that. That's, that's expensive to do in old buildings like this when you're tying in. Mm -hmm. Sandblasting, removing white paint, removing stucco, doing those restorations um, would, would cast a premium on the project. The new glazing system is roughly 40% of this facade, so that's you'd be saving maybe 60% of the building, 40% of it would be new already. Okay. Um, that south retail door is not ADA compliant. We'd have to do something with that to build a ramp somewhere inside or outside or somewhere. Uh, that would cast a premium. And even if we do all of that, even if we do all of that, we'd have to recreate the mansard, that uh, gable end that's in the original fabric of the building right there, all that would be recreated. Those panels in the top would be recreated. They would be new. I think it would just be lost. So we looked at all that, and we just it's just would be really difficult okay. to do. Um, do we have any further comments? Um, so I've heard this building described as generic, kind of derogatory statements about it. Um, it's just an old commercial building, very generic, not of significance. Not for me to decide, obviously, but why is this like generic, old style worse than a new generic kind of just building? We've seen the other, we've seen other buildings built on Rantoul Street, very generic, not very architecturally interesting, blocky brick. You know, what would we be gaining by putting in another generic housing building? Here instead of using this facade, so it's all I have to offer. Not really our purview. We're not. It, it, if I may just uh, address that, I mean, the, this process is not about what the new construction. It's about what what series of criteria we apply to old structures. And uh, you know, there have been some very good and thoughtful comments here about work that this board has done, and, and I was fortunate to be involved with a few projects. Uh, one is uh, the you mentioned the Johnny Appleseeds building, that was uh, done uh, in conjunction. But that—that's—that's that's what this is about. That's the first. If, if you're going to mention thing. that, I have to no. say you wanted it torn down because you were representing a client. No, no. Yes, I was, I want, I was the one who worked out the, the deal. But to Walgreens. Keep it but I'm not in a debate with it. It was so Walgreens that said that. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So getting back to the Johnny Appleseeds building, uh, that was done in conjunction with this. That was the first period building. That had historical significance, no question of it. The, um, uh, I was fortunate to be involved in the United Shoe Project. That was one of the first steel reinforced concrete buildings in the world. That had historic significance. Uh, uh, right up the street from the Johnny Appleseeds, one that we mentioned, the Bush United States, that there was a building there that was preserved. That, had, was first period that had historical significance. Not unfortunately, not every old building has historical significance, uh, and I think that it's important uh, that we distinguish between those that are and those that aren't. And because to make buildings that are less than that that level is to lower the standard of, of historical significance. So I would just ask you to keep that in mind. Um. Are we done? I just had one quick <laughs> question. Um, my name is Dan Stevens. I live at 14 Rowell Ave and own a business, video production business in Beverly. And my question is just, I'm just curious, um, how does it work in cities like, you know, for, to John's um, example of, um, you know, Salem and obviously Flatbread building. And I used to live right down the street from there, like an ugly, Goodyear thing, but making it look pretty awesome. And then 
cities like Lowell, who are, obviously they have old mill buildings that have huge historical significance, but then there's other little ones peppered in here and there that have different sort of historical significance. How is, um, I guess, how is something like this um, different, and how are those sort of decisions come to when the historical significance to this degree has more of an aesthetic value rather than a, and I mean industrial aesthetic, not like, not like sexy, cute, um, <laughs> <laughs> like this old picture, but it has just like that industrial, like where a brewery would go in or, or where a whatever would go in. Like I'm not saying I just want more, I can't even drink beer anyway, so. Um, <laughs> but, so not, but just to that point, that sort of whatever would be built up on something like that, that historical significance is attractive to businesses and a and new homeowners too. I have a lot of friends similar age to mine. I just bought my house a year ago who seeing buildings like this torn down are looking across the bridge and other places to buy because it's not as it doesn't have its historical value um, anymore. And I just wonder what sort of consideration, is there consideration in, in something like that, in building a, continuing to keep a general aesthetic rather than building a brand new one? Um, that has historical, still talking about the historical significance of it. That, that's part of our judgment. It, and the issue can be, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily say that the building itself has to be significant and maybe significant to preserving a, a streetscape that is considered to be significant mm -hmm. or important to preserve mm -hmm. and losing the building yeah. would be like yeah. pulling a tooth out. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it doesn't, in a building like this, we're looking at, as, at it as a <coughs> building type. Mm -hmm. um, it's up to us to make judgments as to whether this building is representative of that building type and <coughs> has significance or not. Um, it doesn't necessarily hinge on having lots of gigaws on mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. but but it does hinge on our judgment as mm -hmm. to you know, the building type and how good an example this is, how it fits into the general character and so on. Um, the issues you raised about what happens in Salem or Lowell, Salem has an urban renewal mm -hmm. redevelopment authority mm -hmm. um, that got born out of trying to tear everything down, but okay. got you know, transmogrified many, many years ago into mm -hmm. an overall review agency. And you know, I would suspect that lots of the projects you're talking about uh, came under their jurisdiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily subject to a demolition delay ordinance. They were subject to a municipal review process, mm -hmm. planning department, redevelopment authority, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The same is certainly true of Lowell. Lowell mm -hmm. has a plethora of organizations and, you know, that deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of demolition delay. In the case of Beverly, demolition delay is one instance. There also is a design review board, there's a planning board, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Then um, I could add, in Lowell, the, um, historic, the historic board is established by state legislation okay. that actually gives them pretty far-reaching control over what happens, oh, okay. including enforcing minimum maintenance requirements mm -hmm. within a specific district. So it's very different from a local ordinance that establishes yeah. a commission like this. Okay, cool. Yeah. So there are you know, a wide range of things that we yeah. generate the preservation of certain yeah. types of buildings. Um, so, um, that said, have we done? Are we done? Okay, seeing no further requests for comments, I will hereby close the public hearing, and uh, this will now go into our discussion. Um, we ask you to refrain from comments um, while we're doing that. Um, and uh, we're simply going to go forward. I think we could. So, you know, my question to the commissioners is, what do they think? <laughs> and the first take question, historic significance. Yeah, the historic significance is the first question. Well, it sounds like we've been talking a lot about significance relative to the economic history of the city and the automobile industry in the city. 
and it sounds like a lot of people who've attended this meeting tonight feel that it is significant to that history. Um, you know, our ordinance allows us to declare significance to for properties that uh, relate to the broad economic history of the city. And I would say the question is, um, is this building part of our economic history? The answer is yes. Is that economic history significant? I think automobile um, construction and sales and maintenance is important to the history of the city. So I would feel that it is significant. The other term that's been bounced around is integrity. And I think I just want to remind commissioners what integrity means. Um, there are actually seven qualities that contribute kind of in composite toward the sense of integrity. And it's not just about the stuff we can touch. The seven qualities, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. Location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So of those seven, we've been talking about how the materials aren't there. Maybe the design isn't there as much as it was historically. But I would argue location, 100 years, same spot. The setting, the industrial commercial zone of our city, same. The feeling. The sense that that is an industrial property, you know by looking at it that it has some place in our economic or industrial history, commercial history. And the association, the fact that it has been a car dealership for so long. And in fact, don't we think it's been a Ford dealership for that length of time? Yes. yes. So of the seven components of integrity, I feel like four are pretty, pretty present in the property. Um, so it makes it a little bit borderline in terms of integrity, but I just wanted to raise the issue that integrity is not always about the physical material that's left. It's a very strong component, but with a building that didn't have a lot of decorative or um, craftsmanship to begin with, what you look at are massing scale, relationship of windows to the solid forms and stuff like that. And so um, my feeling is that it actually does have a good amount of integrity. So the significance question answered you know, pretty easily in my mind, plus integrity, kind of the, the four to three judgment call on that. I feel like the property is significant. Um, well, I, I think that's great that you actually took those seven uh, principles and laid them out to somebody who had asked a question before about how we think about the criteria and make these decisions. That's really well thought out. Um, I think the strongest part of historic significance in this particular case is its association, its historic association with the city of Beverly as it relates to you know, automobiles and transportation. Uh, and I do think there's a strong case. I'm not as convinced on the integrity side, um, and but I do think from, from a precedent setting and from criteria for our job, our purpose as a historic commission, that this is a historically significant, uh, mainly for its association and its historic association. Um, I echo what Wendy said, because I pretty much did the same thing with the criteria, the seven criteria. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's unique. It's, uh, it's got, the design intent is clear what this is. Um, it's got the windows. It's perfect for retail. It's This is what Rancho Street was for a long time. It was autos, autos, autos. And this is clear what it is. We've heard the case on the Oldsmobile dealership a year or two ago, which was the next two blocks over. Did not have any features anywhere close to this that resembled dealership. Um, I think this is special. I think it, it, I think it is significant historically. It's what this district was about during this time. Um, well, I, the question of locational integrity and significance to me is a double-edged sword because um, it is significant as you know, a, a surviving example of, of the automobile industry that was characteristic of Beverly and Rantoul Street. Um, but on the other side of that coin, there really is very little integrity um, because all of the rest of it's gone. It's the only one left. Now, you may make a judgment that it's significant because in its own right, because it's our last example. Um, but um, 
it no longer has that context. It's, it is there, what's there is there. Um, um, but I don't think as a component of uh, an area of, you know, somebody brought up Auto Mile uh, and Com Ave and, and, right. and Boston, you know, there is, there is vocational integrity in that it is a group of these things and, you know, preserving the group has, has relevance, assuming you consider that to be an important situation. In this case, we unfortunately don't have any more of that context. Um, so it's kind of a, I, said, I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I, there's no question to me that, that, that a so general <laughs> associational value relative to the concept of automobile sales mm -hmm. in Beverly. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, a number of uh, important manufacturers were here mm -hmm. manufacturing cars as well as, as, well as dealerships. Um, but on the other hand, it, there ain't much there now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard for me to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can see a judgment of being significant, but it's pretty marginal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my thoughts, uh, for whatever that's worth. So you don't think it would have been eligible for inclusion in the district, the transportation theme district, if there had been time and fee of, to allow expansion of that district at the time? You don't think we would have considered including that building I don't in know. that district? I don't know. You don't know. I mean, that, that, the boundaries were set by the folks in Mass Historic Commission. And, 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 well, the boundaries were partially set by the amount of fee they had to, um, to nominate that district. The district, um, the resources relate to the introduction of the railroad. Oh, it was railroad, not just yeah. transportation. Correct. Okay. Okay. Take it back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anyway, um, do we have folks who would like to make any further discussion? First of all, any questions to? The owner. Um, do we want to have a motion? Does someone want to make a motion? Sure. Well, I think you have the strongest language. Uh, I move that we determine the property significant to the economic history of Beverly. So, any of the other elements that you have on your, on your list, though? No. Do I need mean, to support it? No, I think it's, it's <laughs> for the record, you may want to say yeah, the old one. Based on location yeah, design because <laughs> setting. Not, because personally, my um, motion would, I, I believe it should be deemed as sort of significant, but my motion is not as qualified in terms of the number of items that um, that you see, which I I don't necessarily disagree with. I think you just articulated it better. So I just wanted to make sure that you know, if I make a motion too specific, one might object to the specificity of the motion. That's true. So, so. I, I leave my motion as I move that we okay. determine this property historically significant and that it meets the criteria for significance in the area of broad economic history. Second that. Okay. All those in favor? I'll go along with that. <laughs> um, so that passes, so we now have to no, consider. That's fine. It makes perfect sense. Now we have to consider the question of is it a building that should be designated personal mm -hmm. um, So, again, comments. Who wants to dive in? The harder one. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll begin with it. I really feel like this is where, um, unfortunately, there isn't um, a lot of. Uh, fabric left in the building. I think of one of the reasons we're sitting here tonight is because what is um, significant about this site is the scale of this building uh, on Rain Tool Street and what it could be. Um, but that's really not our purview. Um, we're really talking about whether it's historic, you know, whether it's preferentially preserved. And I think that um, when you compare it to Many of the other decisions we've made uh, on the Enterprise uh, car dealership as well as the other car dealership, those we build car dealership, uh, this has less integrity than those. Um, and I feel the fabric isn't there. Um, and so I feel like it shouldn't be a preferential so That's a hard decision that I believe based on that criteria. 
I think some of the features could be restored. Pardon? I think some of the features can be restored. And this is an opportunity to retain a historic building. Um, historic buildings are assets to communities, as you pointed out. People are looking for things that are unique and uh, industrial, kind of 30s vibe is super hot right now. Um, it's different. It's it's a uh, um, it almost gives a, an interesting theme to something that's going on down there, which is something that can attract people to come. We don't, nobody says, "Hey, let's go hang out where there are a lot of tall brick boxes." You know, like let's go here. You know, th this let's check this out, and it has. I think this is a great opportunity to um, leverage. The, the historic nature of this to uh, at least preserve the facade, the front part, and keep it interesting. We could still have a big building on the back with a zillion apartments um, without compromising the loss of what is an interesting facade on our streetscape. I, I looked in the, at the actual ordinance while we were reviewing material earlier, and the language is that you determine the property, preferably preserve, I'm paraphrasing, but if the property has made an important contribution to historical and or cultural resources of the city, so that it is in the public interest to preserve that property. So just sticking to that, the question is, has it made a contribution, and what's that contribution? And is that significant enough to be in the public interest to preserve it? So I can't get over the 100 years of the same use. And to me, it feels like um, a really deep root for the city that has kind of anchored itself on Rantoul Street, and that is part of where our city grew from. And that is the contribution it made. The fact that that dealership has been there for 100 years meant that the city was thriving. I'm sure it had down times and up times, but the fact that it remained um, to this day as an automobile-based business when the other ones that were mentioned, Beverly Glass, the one down by the hot dog place across from CVS, have all been kind of converted, changed, or lost. But this one survived, and I feel like, you know, Councilor Rand's comments about it's amazing you can buy a car two blocks away from the bus one of the busiest train stops. That is kind of the rich layer of history that we have. And Rantoul Street is kind of the gritty history, and we like to focus on maybe the Cabot and the estates and the ocean front properties that are really beautiful, but history isn't always about beauty. And I feel like this property has contributed in that it has stood fast for 100 years as part of sort of a commercial anchor in our city. Um, and regardless of the, the sort of borderline in integrity, you still look at it and it still tells you about that history. You can still feel that history, you get a sense of what it what it meant to the city. So I feel that it is preferably preserved. Um, I'm fairly dubious myself. Um, you know, I think the loss of integrity is quite real. Um, I, um, I, as someone who's trained as an architect, I tend to look at the design. Um, and I, I, the original building had some character. Um, this has very little. This building essentially reads like a car dealership of the last 50 years, not of the last 100 years. Um, it, uh, you know, on the other side of it, I could get romantic about the steel windows and that that's the generic of an industrial you know, facility back there and so on and so forth. Um, but, um, you know, there, there are very real problems associated with that. Um, there was a time when those of us in historic preservation were not very excited about facades, preserving the facade with a building behind it, mm -hmm. glue to it. 
um, um, although some of the more successful examples have been cases where the building has been stepped back fairly significantly um, that's behind it. Um, um, I can even admit to having participated in some of those. Um, um, it's difficult, I guess, um, you're correct, we could reconstruct the facade. Um, I'm not sure what we've done in the process of that. And in the end, if this becomes a brewery, <laughs> what does that have to do with the car dealership? Um, um, you know, it, it might have more significance if the car dealership was to persist, but it's not going to. Um, so I'm I'm not very sold on the concept of, of it's being preferably preserved. It's not quite some fairly mundane school buildings get preserved with this criteria because the associational value to the many generations of people that have gone through them is very real to the city and to the populace. I don't quite think that that applies to a car dealership. Um, uh, I don't think that people get romantic about saying I bought my car at my first car there. Um, so, and it, as I said, it, there is not a lot of context relative to that history. There it is in isolation, so how do you, how do you deal with it? Um, if we do designate it as properly preserved, um, the long and short of it is that the, the developer will proceed to do what they're planning to do eventually. Um, and whether they make some decisions to incorporate aspects of this to do as, as um, Ms. Rand suggests of incorporating some memorial aspect of it in the design, whether it is something that's incorporated in the design of the building or uh, exhibit stuff or so on. You know, I, um, that, that aspect of public's history, I don't know. We can't tell them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, whether they decide they want to do that is not probably going to be determined by our determining the building preferably preserved. Um, um, you know, I, I would think it would be conceivable in redevelopment to, you know, to keep the primary building, the office, the display building, and build something behind it. Um, there are you know, issues with that, but that's not our yeah. problem. Um, but uh, I, I just am somewhat dubious as to whether it really merits uh, being raised to that level. Um, and the gentleman made comments about, well, the design of the front is now something that's still 50 years old, but um, that in and of itself doesn't make it significant. The issue is, is it important? Is it something that enhances the design and functionality of the building that makes us think it's something that's a, a, a change over time that it's significant? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just the opposite. It's made the building more mundane mm -hmm. and taken away its character. Um, so there's sort of where I sit. We're, we're missing Martin. <laughs> it's like the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so, there we are. But you know, the friend box factory had no window, did not have its original windows or doors. Which the box store? The friend box factory, yeah. The one. Yeah. yeah. The veterans housing. Yeah. The veterans housing. That, that was judged to be a contributing building to a historic district, a grouping of buildings, not, not an individual. You know, right. By and of itself. And but that means it still has merit. But, and its character is what, its architectural character is in fact what it is, brick with those windows. Mm -hmm. um, it, its architectural character per se does not change dramatically over time, at least from the street. Um, so I don't think it, I don't think it's comparable. I mean, the fact that it was, we 
you know, it was this site and the areas around it were sort of carved out of, or not, I should say, not included within the district. I mean, we could look more carefully at whatever the MHC's language was. Do you think it was just because it wasn't there wasn't enough money to, to study the significance? No, I think it's be, it specifically it says it's based on railroads. Yeah, the railroads and the density of transportation in general. The density of structures around the Odell Park and the, the Beverly Depot um, and the hotel and, and everything that's happening around that. It's specifically resources development was a direct result of the introduction of the railroad to Beverly in 1839. Mm -hmm which would not be that building. Right. But the carriage manufacturing building was included because it was an associated transportation use. Manufacturing. The they did include manufacturing. manufacturing in it. Even though because it predated this, the train? Didn't that one predate the train company? The carriage factory? No, not really. It didn't predate it? No. Okay. I will tell you. 1870. <laughs> Okay. But I want to make a clarification to your point. So I don't think that our ordinance requires that we know that a delay will result in the preservation of the property for us no, to propose the delay. I think that the ordinance is written, determine significance, then determine whether it's prefer preferably preserved because of the contributions the property has made and because of the public interest in the protection of that property. So. It doesn't matter if we think it's not going to be saved. I think we need to stick to the mm -hmm. the, the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't disagree with that. I know you're. I, I just think I don't think there's enough of the automobile district. I want to call it that of that part of our industrial heritage, commercial heritage. There's it's, it's just not enough of it there to say that, that there's any integrity to it for that association. I think the association is, is really the sort of concept that it's been a foreign dealership for 100 years, period. And that it's you know, perhaps the oldest car dealership. But then it still conveys that history. It does. I don't think it's the fact that cars live in that building that makes it significant. It's that you look at that building and you know that it was built for that kind of purpose. But how does that make it more... I see that as a strength for deeming it historically significant, but not necessarily a strength for seeing it as being preferentially preserved. Well, the language about preferably preserved is it's made important contributions to the historical and or cultural resources of the city to be in the public interest to preserve it. So, right, but there's but a difference between recognizing the significance of its contribution over time to understanding you know, its economic importance to its future the, the second part of that, which right, which basically talks about. Um, I, I read it differently. I read it as historically, it has made an important contribution to yep, the history um, of the city, yep, and that there's a public interest in preserving that because of those connections. Mm -hmm. I, I, I our intent and purpose is to is encourage the preservation and restoration, rather than demolition of such buildings and structures, and by furthering these purposes to promote the public welfare and to make mm -hmm. the city a more attractive and desirable place in which to live and work. That's the ordinance? That is our, the ordinance. Um, and, and to me, the building doesn't sing out and say, I'm a car dealership. I'm just as really? a commercial, you know, <laughs> building really? set up for this. No, not, it doesn't. Okay. It's, it's just too bloody mundane and could have been any number, you know, it could have been some kind of departments, you know, one story department okay. store with big display windows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, it doesn't say it like some other car dealerships that I know of say it. Mm -hmm. So are we trying to convince one of them? <laughs> I don't know. Jim's, make a motion. No, um, Jim's quiet. No, I, I, again, I, I really see the, its historic significance, but I don't see it being preferentially preserved. I just think it doesn't have the integrity. I also think that it, in terms of the second half of that, there's not a, a great public benefit for how we're measuring it. Um, I, we can't influence the design review and, and how they're going to do it. I personally would rather see I mean, for me, it's about a scale issue. I really like the scale of that building. Mm -hmm. But I can't influence the scale of that building 
Um, I can't influence the design of the scale of that building because that's yeah. not my decision. It's not about the facade of this building to me. It's about that whole scale, uh, the whole block. Um, and that's not, and so based on that criteria, historic significance is a yes for me, but preferentially preserved <coughs> is a no. So I would make a motion that it, will, it not be preferentially preserved because it doesn't have the integrity, and I'm basing that on precedent the, of two of the other three uh, car, car dealerships that we've looked at. Um, one which was an Oldsmobile dealership where my family bought all their cars, so it has much more not the Ford. And then the other, the Enterprise, which again has its own history too. That's beside the point, but I would still say that the integrity there, it just doesn't have the integrity to, to uphold the standard of historic preservation uh, and being historically and being preferentially preserved as our vital and basic mistakes. So I'll make that motion, motion's on the table, that it not be preferentially preserved. Um, do we have a second? Where does that fall to the chair? <laughs> yeah, like, I guess I'll second it. Yes. Uh, is there any further discussion? But I don't think that the preferably preserved criteria relates to integrity. I think integrity relates to significance. I think you determine significance based on the history of the property and how much is sort of left of those seven qualities of integrity. Mm -hmm. And I think the question of preferable preservation is about the contribution of the property to the city's history and whether it's in the public interest to preserve the property as a legacy of that history. That's mm -hmm. so I respectfully disagree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Respect, respectfully here, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I would make one other distinction. I mean, if we compare this to a railroad station, our railroad station in particular, um, the number of people that are serviced by that facility and go through that, use that facility over the years is quite immense and it becomes symbolic. I don't think that kind of criteria of and, and, and that is clearly a public benefit, um, has been in the case of our depot. Um, I don't think that sort of standard, if you will, applies to this. Um, you know, it, it just is I'm not. I'm sure this thing, you mean just the volume of people who I, I'm interact saying, with the property? I'm okay. saying that people have, uh, a railroad station has had people using it day in, day out. You know, for many years, people form associations with it um, for whatever they are. I'm not trying to throw a value judgment on the associations, but I'm saying that it becomes a symbolic thing, um, a symbolic element for this for, for the city. Uh, it becomes part of city center, if you will, um, whatever. Um, and I don't think this is much more in isolation in comparison to something like that. Um, and our judgment of determination of preferably preserved is generally more you know, limited to things that really rise up. But I would say it occupies a pretty substantial space on our second major arterial road in our city. And people interact with that building. They might be in their cars, but I drive it's by it every time no I come less, to City Hall. <laughs> it's no less recognizable whether it's cherished or valued in the same ways that the depot is, I can't say, but I, I, I wouldn't use that as a measuring stick. I would, I would only, and I don't want to, I would only say you're talking about its contribution to the public. You're measuring it in different ways. Yes. So, yeah. Which is why we're not in agreement. <laughs> Well, but this is the first time I think we've, we've called the order. You have a motion. Yeah, we have a motion. Yeah, we, have we, have a motion. we also have 10 days to decide. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we also have 10 days to decide according to the ordinance. After the year? After the year? Yeah, that's true. We, we oh, don't make that can, can you tell I wrote this yesterday? <laughs> we generally make our decisions the same night, but we don't have to. No, we have. We how many days? 10. Because, 10. Because of the nature As of our business, I forget. Hold on. We have other things we do. So we try to talk about them. But I don't know what happens if we have a tie. Is there I don't know. Is there a lower court? <laughs> 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 it's a for us. I know it's in there. I just can't. 
put my finger on it. Well, if there's a motion, you can have a tie vote. You can have a tie vote. Yeah. yeah. What does a tie vote mean? It means it's not preferentially preserved. You have to have a majority for that determination to be made. I, I don't know if that's. I'm not yeah. sure we can take that answer yeah. from you. Exactly. <laughs> we have the commission to figure to, uh, After said public hearing, the commission shall, within 10 business days, determine whether or not the subject building or structure is either significant or preferably preserved. And, and I, I would them. presume that our fifth member, who's not here tonight, can't participate in this because yeah. he hasn't been I don't believe he can. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's okay. I would I don't agree. agree. But I don't think he can. Too bad. Right. So did we vote on the motion? No, we didn't. Okay. And the hearing is closed. It can't be continued. Pardon? The hearing is closed. It can't be continued until we have five members. I don't know. Question. I don't know. <laughs> do we, do we, do we sure. want to basically continue? I think you can continue. I uh, did close the hearing. Okay. You can't have a member vote on uh, you know, when they're not in the present for the public hearing. Yeah, her question was, can we continue here? They have to be there for the whole public hearing. They have to be there for the whole public hearing. Yeah, okay. No, no. That makes Martin's sense to me. Can't weigh in. <laughs> well, I guess the question. <laughs> I, the, 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 I mean, the, there's the. There, there are two questions. You know, I hear your comment that if it's a tie, that it reverts to, to a negative vote, essentially. I don't know if that's the case or not. So that, well, if it's not, that would be something that the city solicitor can determine. For right, right, right. That's, you have a motion, you have a second. It's, you know, it's, you, know, you got to call the question on, or, uh, or with your eye, the motion. Yeah. Um, and... But I, I, what I'm saying is I don't know. It would be up to the city solicitor to tell us what a tie vote means. Mm. Does it mean right. that the building is not designated preferably preserved and a discussion? Or does it, right. or does it mean we have to go back? And <laughs> if we vote tonight, can we reconsider within 10 days? I don't, I don't think, so. think so. It doesn't say that. <laughs> So let me ask you this question: Would the, is there additional information? What would continuing the hearing do? Is there more information that would be helpful to to get our fifth member? But if yes, but he would be allowed. But if he yeah, wouldn't be allowed, allowed, it doesn't matter. I know where he'd vote if he was. But yeah, it's irrelevant. Right. But I mean, even if he was or was, just if he came. No, it was just to yep, yep. to have the full commission. Yeah. Present. Right. Right. It tells us why we don't have even number boards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is actually precedent saying we have never. Yes. 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 We almost so always vote unanimously, yeah. whatever it is. Our apartment is already Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a motion on the table. Or I mean. There is. <laughs> 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 you did no vote, right? <laughs> <laughs> you vote. And you seconded it. I know. Right. Oh, um, I guess. I, I open further discussions. Do we want to uh, continue the meeting, not hold the vote, and come back again to hold the vote? I'm not sure anything's going to change. Yeah. Uh, or do we want to simply just go forward with it? Period. What do you mean, go forward with it? <laughs> well, the hat, hold the vote. Hold oh. The, you know, actually make and then, the vote. If Martin can't vote, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he can't vote, so it's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. Um, so it, it's only if, if any one of us gets a clairvoyant <laughs> change, <laughs> change of heart if I one a, way or the other. If I have a stroke in the next minute. <laughs> I, I mean, this is a remarkable meeting for many reasons, but the number of people who are here tonight is more than I've seen at any of our meetings Absolutely. ever. Yep. And the majority of those who spoke, which is not the majority of everybody who's here, yeah. were concerned about the loss of the building. Mm -hmm. So as a representative of the public, yeah. how do you hear that and then still decide that there is no public benefit in preserving the building? I think I, because um, I do feel that there is a public benefit that has been voiced here tonight. 
But I also hear, and this is where I have to separate between what our purview is and thinking about what our job task in terms of t determining historic significance in preferential treatment. A lot of concerns tonight were about the broader issue of Rantoul Street and the development that's happened on Rantoul Street. And for myself, I've, I've even said that the design, what I like about that site is it's, you know, it's industrial presence, the scale of it. It's a low-rise structure, and it has a streetscape of you know, some kind. And that is something that we don't really have. Um, it, it's a design question, which we don't really have a purview. And a lot of what I'm hearing tonight is the same thing. I mean, clearly the comments that were read into the record and comments that were made by the public that would be back and forth in that were, in my opinion, split. But there's a stronger undercurrent of concern of what Grand School Street looks like and what design decisions are made um, for the future, which is outside of the purview of this particular issue. And I guess what I hear mm -hmm. is that we like what that building looks like. And so this commission has the opportunity to extend its life and see if there are options other than demolition. Mm -hmm. and whether we like what would go there if it were to be demolished doesn't negate the fact that there's a lot of support for the, the design as it is. Whether it is mundane or generic, um, there's some public support there. So I guess giving it the 12 months for consideration of some kind of preservation treatment to me reflects the public interest and the public voice that was heard tonight. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. If, if I felt like that was what I heard tonight, but I didn't. I mean, and, and I don't know. Does that mean that you don't vote and we extend the hearing, and the public takes this as an opportunity to go out and raise more voices? That one the way or the other. The hearing is closed. I think yeah, we've yeah, already talked about that. Yeah. No. So then I think so. I didn't. But yeah, I saw. I see it as a split. I see. This, I see the issue as much broader than a bigger one. In this particular I, I totally agree. Yep. Yes. But I, I guess the purpose of this commission mm -hmm. is to reflect the public interest mm -hmm. in the preservation of our historical assets. Yep. So I just that's well understood. Mr. Chairman, you have a, a motion and a second. Yeah. Can we have a call of the vote? Huh. Not your decision to make. I know it's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have any further discussion on the matter? We obviously have some. Let me ask you a procedural question. Is there an opportunity now? Would you have to close the hearing? Did we close physically the close the hearing? No, yes. yeah, the hearing's Sorry. done. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm also not totally persuaded that folks who would like to see the building kept or more interested in that because of concern about what may replace it than they are with concern about the building itself. You know, I'm reading some things into people's minds saying that. Um, I guess that's a poison pill. Right. But, you know, I think that, you know, that's, to me, that's somewhat of a reality. It's not clear to me uh, how much this building, I mean, that's a, symbol of uh, our industrial past and the commercial past, whatever, is is embedded in the public imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's sort of, I guess, my call between this and the railroad station. I think the railroad station is embedded in the public imagination. People, all, everybody knows what it is. Um, I'm not sure how many folks know what this is other than, oh, yeah, it's car dealership. So anyway, I guess I will call the buddy into a vote. Unless somebody has objections to that. Could you uh, remind us what the motion is? Pardon? Remind us what the motion, the motion is. Well, the motion is that the building be deemed not preferentially preserved. And for yes. some reasons? Uh, the reason is that the, the integrity of this building, uh, there there is no integrity Whatever, um, whatever architectural, significant architectural features that 
helped to um, keep, hold the integrity of the building are, are no longer there. It's no longer an example, a great example of, uh, of architecture in this period for Carthage. So, that said, yeah. all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed to the motion? It is a tie, yeah. whatever that means. <laughs> Figure it out. Find out. <laughs> okay. So thank you, everybody. To be determined. Time. Yeah, yeah, really. Yes, thank you for your time and input. Thank you.